As Priscilla said, my name is Sherry Holly. I'm a Clackamas County Master Gardener, and I'll be presenting today raised bed gardening. I'd like to take, take a quick look at this first slide and note that the walkways look a little odd. They have to be black landscape cloth to keep debris from getting between the material we already have in the bed. Also notice over on the right lower corner, there is a cloche with winter veggies in it. Today's class is a 10 minute university presentation of Clackamas County Master Gardener Association. It's offered in collaboration with and in support of the OSU Extension Service Master Gardener Program. Our objectives today are first, know the steps for starting a vegetable garden, and then we'll go through the rest, but then we'll go through them again as we get to them. Know the different definition of a raised bed garden, learn the pros and cons of raised bed gardens, learn the two types of raised beds, learn construction of a basic raised bed, and be aware of materials safety for raised beds and walkways. We're going to start off with some of the basics. It's good to locate your beds in full sun. Six hours minimum, eight hours plus is more what the plants would really like to have. You want to avoid low spots. It's not so visible here in the slide. However, um, if you look, you can see that there's a higher spot on the far side. So this garden is in and kind of between two, two small rises. There's probably five to 10 feet difference. If we have a freeze, the plants down in the bottom level will probably freeze, but not so likely those that are up higher. And that's just because in a low spot, water and cold air will both flow. Make sure you avoid low spots. In fact, raised beds are one of the reasons for um, being able to garden in a low spot because you can get them up higher than the native soil. Avoid windy spots. They dry your plants out too quickly. Garden bed orientation. The tallest plants need to be on the north side. And while this slide happens to show a rectangular bed stretched out east to west, we don't all have the luxury of that kind of organization. So it's best just to remember that the tallest plants go on the north side so that they don't shade anybody that is shorter. If the soil is wet right now, if it's too wet, working it will compact the soil and that's going to collapse the spaces for air, water and plant roots, which are all essential to plant life. And since we've just had about three inches of rain in the last three days, I'm thinking not much of any soil out there is going to be ready to work for at least five days, if not longer. The more clay you have, the longer it's likely to take. So site preparation. You need to figure out now where is the sunny spot that you can put your garden. And then you can go ahead and start removing large rocks and persistent weeds. Now persistent weeds are those that you can pull or cut off and they will still come back from the roots. They're mostly perennial. Dandelion is a good example. This one has blackberry and thistle showing. There are a few others that you need to uh, dig out completely. And then also preparation of the site is to take off unnecessary vegetation or you can scalp the soil. So if this is a lawn, you would basically mow it down very short and then you can scalp off the turf. Keep it because you can put it into compost. 
you want to use a spading fork to break up the soil a bit and penetrate in case there are other layers below. The spading fork makes holes deeper into the soil. And so even clay soil can be broken up a little bit this way. And you just force it down, move the fork back and forth. Not a lot of labor intensiveness there. pH scale. This is a good time now that you've got it cleared off. You've got the topsoil off if there is any. And it's time to go ahead and take a test of your soil. pH is typically the major one. And Clackamas County Master Gardeners do a spring fair at the Canby Fairgrounds. This year it'll be April 30th through May 1st. That will give you an accurate pH test. We do it free. Otherwise, there are home tests as shown here. This one has the pH. It also has NPK also that you can check and see how that is. You may want to do, if you're just starting out, you may want to do a test with an analytical lab in the area. After you get your pH test, you'll know whether you need to add lime to your soil or not. Either way, we're typically going to be adding three inches of organic matter. It helps loosen up the soil and it provides nutrients to the plants that you're going to put in. The darkest area here is basically one inch deep, one foot deep by four feet long and about three inches deep. That gets worked into the soil approximately six inches deep. This is a picture that is not in Oregon. The soil happens to be river bottom in California and it's very white so that we can see the difference between the amended soil down below in the inset and um, that the organic matter has made a difference. With 37 inches of precipitation here in the Willamette Valley, it's pretty easy for us to think that soil is dried out or that adding some sort of organic matter isn't making a difference, but it does. Know the definition of a raised bed. The planting area should be higher than native soil for better drainage. Small beds surrounded by walkways prevent soil compaction. And when we mean small, we mean it's not part of an acre. It's not 10 acres, it's just a small bed. Sometimes three to four feet one way and about eight feet the other direction. The bed itself is connected to the native soil and it should have about one third of the native soil mixed in with anything else that you put in the bed. So if you add additional organic matter and, and or other soil, you still wanna make sure you have some native soil. That helps establish the microbes later. Learn the pros and cons of raised bed gardening. Now I have to tell you, there seem to be a lot more pros, but maybe you can think of some additional cons as we go along. Better drainage, we talked about that, but better drainage also means that you're gonna have warmer soil. And here we wanna have as much time for growing and fruiting and harvesting as we can get. The disadvantage or con is that it's going to need more water during warm weather. You can also get bigger harvest because you plant closer and you've been very attentive to increasing the nutrients in the soil where these are raised. Now the con could be that you end up with more produce to process and my heavens, what do you do with it all? Well, there are food pantries and there are Meals on Wheels programs that accept homegrown vegetables. Use walkways to reduce compaction. The thing that is a con there is that they actually do take up space from growing beds. Better access. When you have a raised bed, you can put in walkways, which makes it a little easier to get in and out of your garden almost year round. The beds are narrow and they're ideal for a ground level water system. I always say with timers because it's much more convenient. 
When it's right down at ground level, you can make sure your emitters are by your plants. The con there is if you're used to using overhead watering, you won't really be able to do that without wasting a lot of water. It puts a lot of water into the air for evaporation before it ever hits the soil. And it helps all the weeds that you've watered grow very well. The beds are easier to control pests and weeds, mostly because you have a designated point to focus on. And so when you've got a pest, it's easy to look at a four by four section or even a four by eight bed. I prefer mine though, only three feet wide. And from then you can really focus on the, um, the ground and the plants right in front of you. So you can get the weeds out when they're very tiny and you can usually catch the pests very early. Now, the one thing about the little pests is that um, you might be out in the garden and it doesn't mean you need to watch or run for pesticides to kill these little things. My mother used to horrify me when she would walk out to get the mail past her roses. And on the way back, she would use her fingers to kill the aphids that were on her rosebuds. Well, these days I've gotten to the point where I do prefer having a gloved hand, but I may squish pests with my hand. It also means with a raised bed garden, you can shape an area that otherwise would be unusable for gardening. It does take more work to build any, either of the types of raised beds. We're now going to learn what the two types of raised beds happen to be. One is a little bit easier. The other takes much more forethought and work. This is a photo from one of our master gardeners and um, Mike and Renee Hostler. they had a co-op. So they grew a lot of vegetables in raised bed gardens. You'll notice the upright structures. They would help things like squash and cucumber go up those trellises and then they didn't take up a lot of space on the ground. So your basic mounded raised beds are just that, they are mounded earth. You're basically going to dig down and remove soil from the walkways and you're going to pile it on top of the mounded beds. And here I think it's pretty easy to see the individual had dug fairly deeply to pile the soil up on top. The other thing you might notice is it's a fairly sharp cut on the edge of the bed. It's because this soil also happens to have a bit more clay in it. So once you have dug out the walkway and piled it on top of your mounded beds, you can fill the walkway. Here, the one in the foreground happens to be filled with some wood chips. On the other side, you'll see that there are hills of squash on mounded beds. Well, it's a little hard to tell because the squash covers the mound. But basically those mounds are six to eight inches tall, maybe a little bit taller because this is the same clay soil that we saw on the left-hand side. And a hill of squash is more than one squash plant planted together. It doesn't have to be on a hill. He chose to put his up this way and I know they're on a mound because I saw them when they were first put in and just babies. Learn construction of a basic raised bed. We've already got our soil taken care of. We have turned it to where we have six inches down and we have um, done all of our mending. So now mark your beds and walkways. And you're then going to dig the walkway just like we saw on the other slide. And with most soil, you can only go about six to eight inches high. When you mound, the top of the bed is going to be about three feet across, and the base is going to be about four feet. And that's really all there is. You're going to fill in the walkways with some sort of material. It could be debris from your yard. It could be leaves. It could be wood chips. It could be, in this case, rocks. Those are the rocks I got out of this small section that I made into a small garden. I want you to note that at the corners of these beds, we have something to keep the hose 
from going up over the bed and killing all the plants by pulling them out or breaking them down. The one on your right hand is a tool handle, probably a shovel. My mother was very hard on shovels. And it needs to be pushed into the ground quite a ways because you could be pulling that hose against that hose guard. On the left hand side, I think is a better model for a hose guard. And basically in this case, this is a metal rod. It could be wood or anything that the um, sleeve of PVC could go over. And then when you pull your hose along, the PVC pipe moves and it's a much cleaner pull. You don't have to struggle. A little tool safety is thrown in here. Uh, cultivator rakes and hoes need tines and blades down against the soil when you're not using them. You also need to plant your shovel head and sp spading fork tines into the soil. It'll make them easier to find at the end of the day when you're ready to take your tools in and end your day in the garden. Make sure you take care around people and pets to avoid hitting them with a long handle. Now, when you're doing frame beds, you may also be carrying around two by sixes or two by fours or two by eights, and they're long. They may be eight feet long, they may be longer. So just take care when you're there. Also, if you have back trouble and so forth, you may want to reduce the muscle strain of turning your soil. First, turn the soil about three inches deep. Once you've done that, go back and turn it to about six inches deep. It'll be a lot easier with the first three inches already broken up. And remember, you also went through this with a spading fork or you could have used a shovel to break it up way down deep. So now we're gonna focus briefly on walkway materials. And you'll notice that where I've listed things like cardboard, there's a little italicized word beyond called winter. If you want to be able to go out into your garden all year long, you want something that will stand up to the winter and not get slimy. So the cardboard is a good choice, rocks, gravel, and in this case, brick, except you'll see the brick have green moss on them. That moss retains water. So then when we have freezing weather, like we did last week, it's going to freeze and ice over. And the next thing you know, you're gonna slip on it. So it's a constant problem of trying to clean these. These were all already used and their surfaces weren't smooth. Other things you could use are leaves, straw, yard debris, sand, or newspaper. I've got a couple more pictures as well. The uh, sand I don't prefer because it's too easy to track into the house, whether it's wet or dry. Wood chips are one of my favorites because they give you good footing during the winter and during rainy periods. Grass looks quite lovely. However, Grass does not stay in its bounds. So if you think that grass is gonna stay in that walkway, no way. It is going to work its way under those barriers and right into your bed. And then, because it's a raised bed, it's gonna be really difficult to get it eliminated. Additional walkway materials, we did talk about gravel. This is a picture of gravel. And I mentioned to you before, the black landscape cloth, we put it down so that the gravel wouldn't get a lot of debris blown in on it. Again, you see the black on the right hand and you need to think about what equipment you're going to pull into the garden or push into the garden. You could have a wagon, you could have a yard debris bucket, you could have a wheelbarrow, but what about somebody who's using a walker? They had surgery on their foot and now they need to hobble a little bit with the help of a walker. Or it could be a wheelchair. So think about who may be using it and the width that you need. These happen to be 48 inches wide because I, I measured the wheelbarrow and said, hmm. Some will suggest you can go as small as 16 to 18 inches, but I measured from my bent knee down to the ground and that's 20 inches right there. So where are your feet gonna go? So 
particularly when you're doing mounded beds, you're going to be more tempted to not make a, a wide walkway for other people to use. Frame bed materials. Wood is very popular and it's an easy one to use. Uh, easy not only do you not have to think about everything that you want to do with this raised bed, but you can do it after the bed is put in. So wood is quite versatile. And I like this picture because you can definitely tell that these beds are marching down a hill. And the puppy dog, he wanted to know what the heck I was doing there looking at his yard. And here, these wood frame beds basically make this hillside into a raised garden bed where before there was nothing. And this was a very sunny spot. So if you have wood and you're trying to make a bed that is going to be longer than eight feet or longer, I'm going to say, you may have to do some cross bracing. In this case, this particular gardener thought way ahead and he has one metal pipe buried in the ground. This one I could see. And in the middle of that, he's got a metal rod that has threads on both ends and in the little inset there, we have a nut showing on the outside. He probably will end up filling this bed uh, with more soil and organic matter because it is pretty low on the sides, but he has asparagus in there. And so he wants to give the asparagus a chance. And as it grows, he will continue putting soil around it. If you're making a bed that's like a poured concrete, it's going to take a little bit more forethought. In this case, the left-hand picture shows some trellising there that basically is holding up a mason bee house and the pipes in between there are holding up raspberries. They can get pretty vigorous at times too. On the right-hand side, that happens to be a winter scene. Oh, let's see, I think that was like only a few weeks ago. So we put in straps that we could use stainless steel screws into and have a green house or a screened house. Now a screened house basically is to keep the nasty little leaf miners out of your, your vegetative greens. And, and it allows you to um, switch over to a plastic. Here. In this one, it shows one of those beds that's ready to pour. And I want to point out a couple of things here. Up close to the top of the slide and about in the center, there is a green arrow. And you can see there's a little white something there. Well, it's not very visible, but that's the water so source and it's inside the bed. So there's no tripping over those hoses. The only problem, and no need to worry about hose guards at every corner. However, it does reduce um, the trip hazard of having a hose in the walkway, except when you realize that you still need a force of water to spray off things like aphids and other small insects that may be trying to infest your plants. We have two more green arrows on the left-hand side towards the bottom, and they're pointing to a couple of funny looking little things that look like they're sticking into the area where the concrete's gonna be poured. Those protrusions are kind of a sleeve into which then we can screw the stainless steel screws. Now here is a wooden, several wooden, framed raised beds and their attachments. And I think this was fantastic thinking. And these slides happen to be um, taken at Dean Dickman's, Dykman's um, garden. He graciously allowed us to come in and take pictures. In this case, the top arc there is a PVC pipe put into a larger PVC type that is strapped to that wood raised bed. Now he didn't have to think about that necessarily before he got started. That tall one encloses three raised beds 
and two walkways. Further back in the picture, you can see there's a smaller PVC pipe that has been arced over to protect his tomato plants when they were little and really needed a little extra help. The corners here have black hose guards. And just notice that there is quite a bit of hardware here on these boxes. They can hold other PVC pipes or they can be used if they're horizontal, they're used as clamp base. And we've got a picture of that. So here's one with the horizontal bar being used with split PVC. So you would take PVC pipe, split it down, and then cut it in smaller pieces before you do the splitting probably. And you can use that to clamp down things like this row cover over this particular bed. The little inset gives you a bit of a close up and that it's clamped there. Also notice that Rime is a little bit lightweight, easily moved by wind. And because it's so easily moved by the wind, a bed like this would take at least two people to get it on with ease. If you don't mind struggling with it a little, you work one row at a time there. And on the ends, there's still another piece of PVC to hold that coat row cover in place. A little tip, when you're doing a raised bed of wood, you want to make sure that you use screws. I've been told the ones with a square head are actually the better ones to use. And you want to use blocking at the corners. On the left, you see a box that was made with screws going into the end grain. Well, when it's the end grain, it's much easier for a nail or a screw even to pull out over time. And then you have warped boards and they're not gonna hold your soil in particularly well for very long. And you'll be replacing them a lot sooner than you have to. On the right hand side, right -hand side picture, you can see that the corner has some bracing in it. And that's where you would be able to screw into so your corners are set and you're not going into any end grain on the wood. Our last objective is to be aware of the material safety for raised beds and walkways. The walkways are not so troublesome as the building materials. And this photo, what you can see is the upper beds here are now poured concrete but there's still some lower beds there that, hmm, they look like they're railroad ties, which is exactly what they are. They lasted as used ones, which was what we put in, for about 15 years. And we kind of looked at ourselves and our age and said, hmm, we need something that's a bit more permanent because we're not gonna redo this in 15 years again. So for materials, check the EPA website for current information on wood, wood preservatives. They happen to be reevaluated for safe use every 15 years. The address is going to be in the resources and that page will be coming to you um, after the program, probably at the same time you get the video connection link. Make sure if you're going to use wood that you ask what wood preservative is used on the wood that you're considering for use. Creosote is not registered for residential use, regardless of anything. Chromiated copper arsenate is in review. However, you need to know that the manufacturers thought that it was not safe for residential. And as of December 31st, 2003, they stopped using it and recommended nobody use it in residential construction. Alkaline copper quaternary is a newer and lower risk replacement for the others. If you go to the EPA site, you will see that there are also many other new varieties that are out there. And you can learn more about each one of those at their website. And they will tell you whether it's been registered with them or not, and or when they're reviewing it. So there's a little bit of maintenance that's required 
when you do raised beds and it doesn't matter whether they're concrete ones or whether they are wood. Even if you're going to do just mounded, you'll have some that will slough off. In this case, they kind of settle down and a lot of the nutrients will have been taken up by the plants that you put in there. So you need to add soil as needed. For us, it's about every three years. Though I will say since we rotate it, we don't do all the beds at one time. And that means that we're going to have um, maybe one to two beds to do in a year. If you keep your soil inside your bed a little bit below the top of the frame, you won't have quite as much mess and loose soil out beyond the framework. Here, I noted there's some concrete stepping stones. You may be looking at this bed and saying, that looks like it's wider than three to four feet. And you would be right, it is. This particular bed has been weeded. Soil was added to bring up the soil level. Actually, it was mostly um, composted material. Turned, mixed together, smoothed and covered with, again, mulch. In this case, it was composted soil. Or you can go ahead and use bagged soil mix to bring the level up. In this one, you see where those stepping stones ended up being used. I went for the aesthetics. We see our kitchen garden from our kitchen and we have a lot of windows there. We have a good 10 feet straight out looking at this. So this particular bed with the stepping stones means that even though you're stepping into the bed, you're not stepping on the soil and compacting it. It spreads the weight so that you dare do this. And then you probably are going to have a watering system to maintain. We undo ours from the water system and we drain the water out as much as we can. Sometimes it's more than others. And then you check the large hoses for broken lines and emitter problems, repair those. Look at what I call spaghetti line. It's a quarter inch. And typically you're gonna put inline emitters in that. The others don't fit quite so well. Um, okay, and we have a couple of arrows here. The top arrow is pointing to the quarter inch line and it does have a, an emitter with a stake on it so that it still will be standing up a little bit. The other one is pointing to an inline emitter. They typically are ones that you can, or at least the ones I work towards finding, are the ones that you can adjust. And that adjustment can be anywhere from delivering four gallons of water an hour to 16 or more. It depends on the brand, just as the brand is going to dictate what the names of these little emitters happen to be. So after you do your initial check, you're gonna turn your system on and recheck. It's nice to do this on a slightly warmer day because I've never been able to do it without getting all wet. And some of those emitters will blow on off as soon as you put some pressure on them. Replace any lines when they get too many reconfigurations poked into them. They have goof plugs, they work. They keep the majority of the water in the hose. However, after a while, if you rotate your crops, you're going to find that the hose may not have emitters where you want to put your plants. So you go through and you add some more emitters. I'd say the large line probably lasts three to five years because we do rotate. And occasionally I plant things in here that I've not planted before. And some may take more water while others take a little less. So I'm switching emitters around. They just, the more you have, the more you have possibility of leaking and losing your irrigation water. Water is becoming a very valuable quantity these days. And the one thing that you want to remember is do not move any hoses, not even your regular water hoses. Don't move them when they're frozen because they will break 
And when they break, then you've got a bigger mess on your hand. So always wait until it's a little warmer. This comes in a roll, and so it was very easy to get it into that round uh, shape for putting in that bed. If you want to curve your hose around your plants, you're going to need to have some sort of stake to hold it in place. And probably you're gonna be putting it in in not really warm weather. Uh, we tend to activate ours typically in May, June, late part, or June, June itself, because sometimes we're still having really kind of chilly weather. Any chilly weather is gonna make this hose stiff, and then you're gonna have trouble getting it to stay where you want. Some sort of pin will work. And if you can envision this, you can take a regular clothes hanger, cut off the hanging curved part, cut it in half on the long straight side, and now you have two pins to go down into the soil approximately eight inches. My soil has a lot of organic material in it and it does make it more difficult to put and use shorter little pins. If your soil is pretty firm, which could mean you have quite a bit of clay in it, you'll want shorter pins. But since these are your beds and you could make them eight inches deep with really good lofty loose soil, you'll probably need the eight inches. And I tend to use hangers that come from the dry cleaners. So if I don't go very often, I don't have any pins. <laughs> They'll last quite a while before they rot away. The inline emitter there, I already told you some of these can basically go from four gallons to 16 an hour. I put pins down around those also to keep them from getting opened or closed. They have a little tab on them that I try to secure. That's the end of the presentation, but I do want to go through the resources here. I remember when I was in college, I wondered, gosh, why did they waste all their time doing all those resources? But since I've been doing these talks, I have found them to be not only valuable for me, as reminders, what I need to know and what I need to convey to you. And so here's the website for the US Government Department of Environmental Protection. And it's on wood preservatives, very good, uh, very readable. And it has some scary things in there that that's not used anymore, but they list them anyway, so you know to stay away from them. Then under the 10 minute university, we have handouts as well. And that's under the cmastergardeners.org um, website. And when you go in there, you'll see raised bed gardening. I found that one to be very helpful. It's simple, it's short. Soil 101 is probably a good one to review before you get too much into um, amending your soil. We also have several 10 minute university videos which you can access from the website. The scoop on soil is one of those. It was done by me in the fall. I think it was October when that one was done. But you will also find one that was more recently done, and it may not be at the website yet, but there's also another one um, on introduction to starting a vegetable garden. So these are all very good. And then we have basically the um, Oregon State University Extension publications. And there are a lot in there. They have how to build your own raised bed cloche. And one more page here. You, I put in a couple of these just if you want to look at them. They're fairly short. University of Alaska Fairbanks Cooperative Extension Service. They have one on raised bed gardening. Now, the reason they're using raised beds is pretty much the same as we do here. They need them elevated so they have better drainage and they need the soil warmed earlier because they have a fairly short season. Some places in Alaska more so than others. This one was a good one from Virginia State University, the Virginia Cooperative Extension from Piedmont. Their master gardeners have a website where they do answer some questions. So this one was about do's and don'ts of raised bed gardening. Not something that we're going to go into here, but you may find it interesting and it may help you understand and avoid some of the don'ts. 
So that's what we've got for today. And I want to tell you that when you're looking at extension service sites that are not from our local area or your local area, you need to consider the environment that those are in. Here, we have a lot of rain. Our soil tends to be a bit on the acidic side. And so we are typically going to be adding lime to sweeten the soil. In this case, that may not be true up in Fairbanks, Alaska, and it may not be true in Virginia. So you just need to be cautious. And if you've got your own extension service, which I believe all 50 states have, then I would suggest checking with them. If you run across something that sounds maybe a little bit off for your environment. And least you think that framed beds are a quick job. This one is the garden that my husband and I have built over a 10 year period. And we started off with doing the frame. You'll see some little spindly spaghetti lines. Those are only in there for uh, watering pots, not for watering the beds. Everything else is on the inside. And we ran a special line on the outside for pots. With that, I would like to thank you for attending this presentation. And now we'll go into question and answer with Priscilla. Thanks very much. That was awesome. And we have a lot of questions that have come up. And uh, oh, no. <laughs> well, I want to start from the ground up. So there was some questions about raised beds and what to do to protect them from those ground critters. There were a few questions that came up. So would you just talk, and like I said, we have a lot of questions, not a lot of time, but would you tell us what are some of the options and sizes of, uh, and how to protect your ground so that you don't get those critters coming up underneath? Okay, so when you are working on your raised beds, you may want to pick one first to get your soil out of because you're going to want to take your, in this case, I'm going to talk about it going into wood. It could also go down under a mounded bed, but you're going to take something like you can use chicken wire, but it um, basically disintegrates pretty darn quickly. So I would go with expanded metal or a woven metal and put that underneath. Now you can get those in different sizes and what you want to do is get it in a smaller size. And I'm gonna say half inch to quarter inch. Um, most of your ground critters won't be able to go through it and that'll keep them out of your beds. The other way to do it is make sure that you have a dog that really likes to go after gophers. Could make a big mess, but it works. <laughs> so I hear you saying, as you were preparing the garden beds, make sure to get that down first, then put your soil on top. So that's- yes. You could do it later, but it gets a lot harder. So yeah. if you can start with one, take all your soil out, get your cloth down. If you've got a wooden bed, you can attach it up the sides of the bed and that'll help keep them out. All right. And so working from the ground up, let's talk a little bit about soil. Uh, people were wondering, will double digging um, earth help with water retention? Yes, it loosens the soil. And then as you add organic matter, even your organic matter can absorb a lot of water. And yes. I noticed there was someone else who made a, a comment that critters can go up and over. And in that case, if you've got critters that are going over and not just coming up in the bed, you may want to put up a fence around the bed. Absolutely. Okay, and then speaking about soil, uh, there were a couple of different questions about amending soil. Um, what types of recommendations do you have for fertilizers, organic versus chemical, when to apply those? That's going to be exactly the same that you would use for a regular garden as for a raised bed. And um, basically, you probably need to have your soil tested. So I can't recommend anything for anybody in particular, because even in my own yard, I have different needs. 
like 20 feet from each other. I have clay soil and I have some soil that's really lofty. So it'd be quite different. So I'm not gonna be able to estimate with that. So if you actually go ahead and get a full spectrum uh, analysis done of your soil, then you can talk to your local extension people and they should be able to help you too. Right, and speaking of soil tests, uh, the uh, Spring Garden Fair will be in Canby this year. And we are um, encouraging people to bring soil samples for your pH testing. That's a great place to start, right? And it's free. And it's free. And, <laughs> um, and then we also have a nice accompanying uh, handout that will help you figure out what you need to do to get your, your soil balanced. All right. Um, so working from our way up, uh, there were a couple of questions whether um, the like horse trough metal sides, what are the advantages, disadvantages of those? I did mention to someone that it needs to be connected to the native soil in order to be considered a raised bed. But what about that material itself? What are the advantages of having metal siding? Well, I can't think of a lot of advantages right now. When you put things into a container, they cease being a raised bed. Right. They are a raised container bed and you become mother earth for them. You supply the food, you supply the soil, you supply the water. And if you're gonna use one of those, cause I think they look really pretty neat. Try not to have them in a place where they're gonna get the hot afternoon sun because metal is a very good conductor of heat. Otherwise you can make sure all the plants you put in don't hang over the side and or are grouped a bit more towards the center. Okay, and a person is worrying that they need to reinforce steel raised beds. Um, you know, um, I don't have any experience with it, but obviously metal gets hot and then it becomes more pliable. Um, if they were going to reinforce it, do you have any experience with that? Using Not really. Um, if they were cutting the bottom out and putting it in the soil, they could help reinforce them by putting stakes down in this inside. Uh, typically, you'll notice that those are sort of a corrugated metal mm -hmm. on the sides. Mm -hmm. That is for the very purpose of keeping it stable and in the upright position. Also in the wintertime, because metal conducts heat and cold, you may wanna go out and wrap it with um, bubble wrap. For one thing, there are blankets, anything that can keep some loft around them. The other thing, if you can actually move them, you can move several of them together, and then you only have to wrap around one big blob. <laughs> okay, and I'm, I'm not sure if you touched on this, but Let's just give a quick, quick overview of the advantages of raised beds for say an aging population or someone who has um, mobility problems using a raised bed versus just. Well, I think the biggest advantage is that you are bringing it up off of the native soil level and all the others pretty much remain. And if you're doing a framed one, you can make them much taller. Whereas if it's mounded, you're looking at six to eight inches, probably no more than 10 without having it all want to slough off of the edges. So if you've got wood, you can go up higher. Again, you want to cross brace on those to keep them from getting pushed out basically by the water in the soil. Water wants to go flat and we put it in a raised bed. Well, it doesn't normally go that way. And so it's going to want to spread out and it will push things out of its way. Water is very strong. Yeah, and uh, um, hay bale gardens are becoming uh, popular where you can build a, a wall and then fill in and make a, a raised bed in that. So that's another good option if you yes. don't have access to the wood. All right, getting into crops, this particular person has been using their raised bed for a number of years and they're noticing that their root crops are not as vibrant as their greens, their beans, and their tomatoes. What suggestions might you give this person? Well, the first suggestion would be um, to make sure they rotate their crops. 
add nutrients, keep them away from the very edge. And it may be simple as the ground there dries out too much. Mm -hmm. And when you lay your water lines, make sure you've got them close enough so that those root vegetables are getting enough water. And having patience, you know, some people don't realize it may take 100 to 120 days to get some nice big carrots and uh, people get a little impatient. So, oh, I've never experienced that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and um, yeah, so uh, moving on to uh, Buying quality compost locally. What do we want to look for when we are buying some compost to put into our soil? I know we can't give a specific place to go, but what might people look for when they're shopping for compost? Okay, what they're going to look for is when they look at it, you should find some fairly well composted, but some that you might still recognize as plant material. Um, a lot of places will use sawdust, and so you may get some little chips of wood that haven't been completely com uh, composted yet. And um, other than that, what else can we look for? I look for deep color. It, sh it should be just like your other soil in that if you squeeze some and water drips out, don't use it, but it may mean that it's absorbing more water than what you're going to need because normally it should be really crumbly in your hand. Right. Yeah, I always, when I go and I dig into a pile before I ask for a load to be delivered, I notice if I dig into it and I see steam coming off, that tells me that's a nice robust compost that is Yes, good microorganisms in there that are working. And those are things that are great to add to a, a raised bed. Yes. And that's one of the things. There are a lot of microorganisms out there that will finish decomposing things. And so people don't always have to pull everything out of the ground in the fall to clean it up. They can cut it off and leave it in there to decompose over the winter. Yeah. And um, any plants that would help to attract pollinators? Because if you're going to be growing squash and tomatoes and things that need to have their fruit set, what, what else might go into a uh, raised bed to, to help with that? Okay, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't have those types of things typically in my raised bed. I just have vegetables in it. Mm -hmm. However, everything is close at hand. And we have mason bees. And so the mason bees are going to be out probably in another month or so. And that'll be about the time that trees are blooming and the rosemary is blooming. So you just look at plants that are out there that are gonna be blooming early. Yeah. Well, what we do um, over at Grow an Extra Row where we grow in the community garden is we have um, bags those big um, growing bags. And we plant a mm -hmm. variety of plants in those growing in those. bags. And we set those <coughs> at the end of our rows uh, mm -hmm. about, every, uh, about every five to 10 feet. So that might be an option. If you do not plant in your garden bed, you can just put them into bags. Um, I will put some marigolds into my, my raised beds and that will help with attracting pollinators and then those oh, pollinators oh, oh. get busy in the, me. the vegetables. Allergies, and I'm getting a little too toasty here. Yeah. Okay. Um, kind of winding down here, but um, did you talk <sighs> about how concrete beds might alter the pH of the soil and why that's not too bad here in the uh, <coughs> valley? <coughs> Excuse me. At least it's at the end, not in the middle. Um, when you have concrete, it's going to leach lime. With 37 inches of precipitation here in the Willamette Valley, that's not an issue because we are more typically going to be trying to sweeten the soil by adding lime. Now, if it was too much, I just, I've not had the problem with it being too much at this point. Mm -hmm. So, but if you are in a climate where it is, then you're going to be adding to that. And I'm not going to 
if I keep talking, I'm going to have no voice. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. All right. Do you have any experience with jumping worms? The Asian jumping worms, they seem to be a real problem for this person. I no, don't experience I have not okay. investigated them at all. So that might be a great question for this person to add or send to um, ask an expert because those people have, you know, will do a lot of research and give you a definitive answer. So that's yeah. awesome. They have the research materials right at their fingertips most of the time. So, right. Okay. Um, I think that we have answered all the questions that pertain to what you've been covering today. And oh, good. Um, 